Welcome to The Positioning Show, where we discuss topics related to the practical application of positioning for marketing, sales, and product teams. I'm April Dunford, a consultant, author, and the world's leading expert on positioning for B2B technology companies. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of The Positioning Show with me, April Dunford. Hey, special episode today. We got a guest. I don't have guests very often, so when I do have a guest, you know it's going to be good. And so today's guest is the amazing, incomparable Bob Mesta. Some of you are very familiar with his work. He, he's, he's done a lot of things. He's a hard guy to do an introduction for because he's done so many things. Like when you get talking to him, he's had a handful of startups. He, you know, at one point he was selling houses. He had an investment bank once, but he is probably best known for his work on the, his, the groundbreaking theory around jobs to be John or jobs theory. And so if you're familiar with Clayton Christensen's work and the groundbreaking book, Competing Against Luck, he was one of the original researchers on that research. Bob's work is really focused on what motivates people and how people make decisions. So he's typically working with companies on innovation and looking at new products and how to innovate in a way that leads to lasting product success. What I thought would be really great is if we brought Bob on the podcast and talked about jobs theory and positioning. In particular, Bob's concepts around jobs to be done had a big influence on the way I think about positioning and how I do positioning with my clients. So I thought it would be great to talk about that. I also thought it'd be neat to just get into some stuff that is more tech company focused because he does a lot of things outside of tech. But I wanted to get his opinion on things like product market fit and and pivots and things like that. And so some of his ideas around that I think are really super interesting. I think you folks are really going to enjoy having Bob on the show here. Like he's a he's a a guy that's worked with companies all over the planet. He's a lecturer at Northwestern University and Harvard and so this is some like high quality education you're about to get here. So I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I did. The other thing that was really fun is Bob lives in Detroit. I live in Toronto. It's about a four and a half hour drive between our two places. So I drove down to rewired headquarters to meet with him in person. And so if you're enjoying the video on this, you'll get to see the two of us interacting directly. I don't usually get to do the full Joe Rogan here where we are in a studio with the guest live. So that was really fun for me. Anyway, I hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to Detroit. It's so good to be in Detroit. Yes. I drove all the way here from Toronto. Yes. We're coming at you live from the rewired from the Motown. offices yeah. in Detroit. Yep. So uh, April and I have been trying to get together for uh, like a couple of years. It's been stupid. Yes. Actually. And we were yeah. able to connect on Zoom doing a lot of stuff. But, but yeah, for true. the most part, like we're, we're four hours from each other and, yeah. and now it's a home and home thing. So now I got to go up to see her and she'll come down to see That's me. That's right. Now you got to get in the good. car and drive yeah. up the 401 to see yeah. me. How did we get this? How did this come about? This, this I, you day? know, I, I, like I'm trying to think where I first met you in person. Like we had cross paths and sort of blab yeah. blab here and there, but I think it was, we were in Eastern Europe someplace. At, oh, um, that's right. We were at- uh, How to Web. How to Web. Yeah, great with conference. Bogdan, with Bogdan. Yeah, Bogdan, yeah. great conference. Ryan, Ryan's speaking there this year. Oh my gosh, yeah, so, so much, much fun. fun. Yeah. So much fun. Such a hungry crowd. Yeah. And then and then we've, uh, you know, speaking circuit, obviously we yeah. met each other through that. But, 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 then, but then there was times where like I needed some help or you needed some help. But we oh like, hey, gosh. what are you thinking? And, like, I think it was a lot we, more we were in parallel universes, help. right? I think it was a lot more of me needing some help. What I, what I thought was so cool is like you were the first person – like that I, that I met on my consulting journey yeah. that I thought had it figured out way better than me. I would I would not say I had it figured out, but it might be a few years ahead. But I was like, man, I need to, I need to learn some stuff from Bob. Well, that I remember you were working so hard. I think when, when we first met, you were, you were, you were doing, you know, almost a workshop every week and you were just kind of just, just jamming it all in. I'm like, okay, Too much you're going to, this is, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Yeah, no, and, exactly. And, and, and you, you've done very well. But what you do you know want what? to talk about today? Yeah. What I want to talk about today, I'm not entirely sure that my audience knows you yes, or even the work that you do in particular yeah, yeah, yeah. jobs theory jobs, and jobs, jobs to be, be done, done and all that stuff yeah. and all of that. So could you give us a little bit of like 
view from a million feet yeah, of yeah, like, yeah. what's jobs so, theory? What's jobs to be done? Why should a bunch of founders and marketers or product yeah, marketers yeah. care about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think it starts with, like I've been building things my whole life. My mom would tell you I was breaking. I was an engineer out of the out of the womb, breaking <laughs> things by the time I was two, <laughs> fixing things merely so I didn't get in trouble. I wasn't really that curious. But over time, I got very, very curious. Yeah. And I've been building things kind of my whole life. I've worked on over 3,500 different products and services, ranging 3, from 500. the guidance system for the Patriot Missile, uh, Pokemon Mac and Cheese, Base Camp, <laughs> uh, and everything in between. I just like those first two. Like, yeah. I like how we went. Well, from you got to anchor, right? Missile anchor. systems to Pokemon Mac, Mac and, and Cheese. Yeah, like, the, we the need to come. Let's come back amazing. to that, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right. So, and, I and, 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 and so Pokemon part of it was the other thing is I'm dyslexic. And so I can't read and I can't write it. So I would get these requirements documents from marketing about what was going on and yeah. I couldn't make sense of it because they'd, they'd either have a persona and I'd say, All right, well, can I go talk to this person? And they're like, well, that person really doesn't exist. And they're like, yeah, but I want to, I want to see what like in context, help me understand. And so I ended up uh, learning a lot of different methods and tools. And one of them was called quality function deployment, which was about how do we deploy the voice of the customer? And, and, so cool. and out of this, um, I realized that people valued things or weighted things differently depending on the context they're in. So context yes. matters as much as the product. So much. And so that was where I started to bring in, like, how does context play a role? And then you start to realize, well, it's not only context, but it's the outcome. Right. And so we, we've named that as like the progress people are trying to make and that people really don't buy products. They hire them to, to basically make progress in their life. And so it's seeing yeah. how products fit into people's lives. And then from there, I can actually design better products. And yeah. so that's really where the, this came from. And I've been doing it since uh, the late uh, 80s. I've been doing it primarily as my hack. And then I, I was able to team up with uh, one of my uh, uh, mentors, uh, Clay Christensen, and he helped turn it into a theory. I had no idea what he meant when he said, hey, let's turn this into a theory. But ultimately, uh, he wrote a book called Competing Against Luck. And it's uh, that's kind of a classic where, yeah, where it's all it's it. 2016 that it came out. And from there, like everything's kind of. You know, I, I'm 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 doing that that method, jobs to be done. But I have probably 25 other methods and tools I've been doing. But I'm yeah. most known for jobs to be done. So interesting. So I have I have this kind of relationship to jobs to be done yeah. stuff in that, you know, in the early days of me trying to figure out positioning, yeah. I went through this 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 set of phases. So that it, at the beginning, it really frustrated me that people talked a lot about what positioning was, why it was yeah. important, but nobody had a methodology for actually doing yeah, yeah, it. Yeah. And so at one point I thought, well, I'm going to figure this out. And so the way I did it was I started by busting positioning into pieces. Like, yep. So there's five component pieces. It's yeah. competitive alternatives, um, distinct or differentiated capabilities, differentiated value, yep. which is the key to everything. Yep. Um, best fit customer. So who cares a lot about that value and uh, market category. And so, you know, when I got looking at that, I was like, okay, well, in order for us to have a methodology around this, I need to figure out how do I get to the best answer for each of those things. Yes. And I couldn't figure out everything kind of related to everything else. But it was correlated. It's a lot of times they, they, nobody was getting to the under, underlying causality of what caused these things. Exactly. And so I was, I was stuck on, you know, the, the, the thing sort of felt like a spiral. I would pick a spot we'd work around and, yeah. it, and then we test it and yeah. if it worked great we ran with it if it didn't we throw it out we come back yeah. but how i got out of that thinking was i was listening to i think it was you somebody talking about the milkshake story yeah, probably clay 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 so clay is famous for telling the milkshake story but i was the researcher on the milkshake oh my god so gosh. this was this was a case where um, like, give us the quick yeah, view. So we, so were, we were hired by a by a fast food service restaurant to basically one of the things they are you allowed to say who or they are like really oh, okay we, we can't say who we get it we get it we get a little imagine trouble. though a fast I get a little trouble when food. I say who but but what happened is we asked them what was the least productive piece of equipment in the store and it turns out it was the milkshake machine interesting and so one of the things that we underlying believe is that most innovations come from anomalies. And so we went and looked into the data of the sales of milkshakes and we found these three stores that sold milkshakes in the morning. Hmm. And we're like, well, that's odd. Right. Why, why people, the heck why, are they why is that, buying a milkshake in the morning? And a lot of them and we're trying to figure it out. And it turned out that almost everybody who was buying milkshakes or were the stores that were open that were selling milkshakes, they had a long commute. So it was about anywhere from 25 to 45 minutes downtown. Right. It was, it was a suburb of, you know, LA and Dallas and Atlanta. And yeah. 
they they were stopping and they were only getting a milkshake. They weren't getting anything else. And it's literally like at this point, where I'm like, okay, I'm going to just, we got to go to the stores. And so I'm literally yeah. sitting in lines, knocking on windows, going like, I'm sorry. I know it's early, <laughs> but like, why are you getting a milkshake? And would did, and were, were people and, think you're a weirdo? Like, oh, are they yeah. like, who cares? Right. Yeah. But I mean, that, 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 but some people are like, okay, Mr. Research dude, I'm yeah. going to tell you what's going on no, in my mind. That's right. But this was more like, why, why this, why now, why not something else? Right. And, and this is where Clay starts to talk about the fact this is what you realize is milkshakes doesn't doesn't compete with you know coke it competes with a with a coffee and it competes with uh, uh you know a bagel and a banana and these the other, idea the, was that these people were buying a milkshake in the morning yes, for they, sleep they could sleep longer ultimately it was that they could sleep longer and they they their stomach would not bother them so, later in the day and so it was right so it had to be a, filling and, and they kept saying well is it healthy it's like it's got protein it's got you know a uh, fat it's got carb carbohydrates in it, it like like it, and it wasn't fine. a big mess. Like it, no. like an egg McMuffin is going to get all over my suit. Yep. So one of the so things it fits we, in the cup holder. And and one of the things we end up doing is we end up saying, well, how do we make a milkshake more breakfasty? And we right. made it a yogurt shake. Right. And so it was the beginning of the yogurt smoothies. So and so and so it was all that kind of thing that we were able to come up with. But it all came from the anomaly. And then ultimately, you know, after a long, a uh, fair large period of time, but the, this company is now one of the largest producers of smoothies in the world. So interesting. And see, my but, aha moment but it took on them that. Almost 15 years to get it. This is the, the this is the crazy part because this is at 94, <laughs> right? Right. And, and most people didn't actually. So this is where the product preceded the positioning. And most right. people couldn't think of milkshakes for breakfast. Right. But ultimately, as they, they started to realize, like, I need something to sustain myself till, right. till lunch. And you started to realize that's when the positioning kind of caught up to the product. Well, see, that's it. So like I had heard that story told a million times mm -hmm. and it was always like, it was always told in the context of making a better product. So how yep. do we know yes. what to make? Like, yep. so how do we know what to improve? And so we got to figure out the job that the product is doing. And if we can figure out that, then we can, it. but the first time things really clicked for me is I had heard that story before and I don't know what was different about yeah, yeah. the telling of it this particular time, but I'm listening to this story this time and I, and it clicked for me. I was like, Oh, the insight that came out of that research was the comparisons is to competitive the real, alternatives, the real, the, the the real, real competitive, competitive alternatives, alternatives as opposed not, to theoretical, not what we thought in the office yeah. is what they were acting. So in the office, we're trying to design this milkshake thing because yeah. we think it's competing with Coke. And in fact, it's competing with a donut. That's right. And that's really different. That's right. And so that the aha moment was me for me was so I had my five component pieces. I needed to start with competitive alternatives, but the competitive alternative I needed was the real one. Like if this product didn't exist, yes. what, what would, would a customer do? Use? Right, exactly. And that's the thing is, is most people think of competitive alternatives is only when they're switching, what would they consider? Right. As opposed to, I think we both know in B2B, it's over 50% of over the 50%. don't get acted on because they already have a solution that's, right. that's good enough. And it's okay. And it's okay. And it's and, okay. And the reals, but we never bring you know, my, uh, Microsoft Excel in as like, hey, that's our CRM. Right. It's more like, oh, you can have Salesforce or you can have right. High Rise or you can have like all these different ones. And it really like, no, nope, Excel. Like I enough. have this thing in the workshops that I do. Yeah. When we talk about competitors, if you ask sales, yeah. who do you compete oh, yeah, with? Yeah, yeah. They only give me the list of direct competitors and they will overemphasize anybody they lose to. Yes. Yeah. There's a, bi <laughs> like there's a bias to who they lose to. Or, right. And, and ultimately... A, bi a bias for any, even when they say no, no action, it's like, yeah, but you don't have this and this and this. Okay, we got to have those features. And they, they think totally. they can close oh one God, more totally. one more deal with one more feature. And oh. that's where you get feature creep, right? Oh my gosh, so, so much. So if I go, if I go to sales and I say competitive alternatives, they'll, they'll be like this, this, this. 10, five. And, it, it, and maybe not even that many, like they'll, but you know who gives me the worst list? Product. Oh yeah. So yeah, I go yeah. over to product and I say, well, who's a competitive alternative? And they give me this list of like 30. Right. And then you'll go down that list of 30 and th there's 20 there that sales has never seen in a deal. Never. Ever. Right. So they're theoretical competitors. That's right. That's what I The I way I start too. describing it is they're horizon competitors. Like maybe if they got their act so, together and things changed or whatever, we might see them on the horizon and maybe product needs to keep their eye on them a little bit or something. So I, so I have a different take but, on that. I yeah, think, I think their competitive reference is who can do the functions. Oh, totally true. 
Right. And so my thing is, is that we might never see them. Customers totally remember, true. but you know what? They have a sorting function. We have a sorting function. We can both do these right. things. We can both actually print reports. So, you know, they, they so could true. compete with us. And so yeah. it's this, it's this right. notion of like piecing together from a, like, it's almost like what products do I compete with? Not through the customer's eyes, but through the right. functional elements of what it does. Eyes. Exactly. I Googled it and, it, yeah. you know, and there's this and, and, you know, like, and I kind of call this, this is like the ghost, right? Yeah. They, 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 it's living in our head, but it's not real. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's so, right. And, it, and it's, and, it, and it's, it's your point. It's, it, I like the idea of it, that it's theoretical. It's not bad, but it's the fact that they just, they end up seeing everybody as a competitor. Right. And what you end up doing is you either overemphasize or underemphasize as opposed to really focusing on what progress is a customer trying to make. That's this exactly is, it. This is where you get you go awry. Like if you look at the camera industry, the camera industry focused on each other so much that they lost the entire industry to Apple. Right. The entire industry. It's it, like their unit sales are down 90% in 10 years. Not because, not because they made bad product. Not because they had bad positioning. It's the fact that they didn't focus on the customer. Yeah. That's the real problem. And so part of this is to realize the truth comes from the customer. And what's really interesting is most customers behave irrationally. There is like when you ask them, it's like it seems like why in the world would they do that? And what you realize is that context makes the irrational rational. Right. And so right. that's why you have to get out of the room, stop thinking about just what people could do and talk about what people really do. What they and, actually And do. what is their reference point in their mind as they go into this situation and go like, yeah, I need to do something new. Right. And so most people think about, they talk about jobs and they say, well, you know, you're always looking backwards. And it's like, no, what I'm trying to do is connect the dots of how they did it in the past. So then I know how people are going to play it out in the future because how they did it is a pattern and that pattern will repeat itself. And so ultimately, yep. I'm trying to find the causes that, of what causes people to buy something as opposed to I have to convince somebody to buy something. Right. Love it. Love it. Can you, can you give us an example? We were talking earlier about intercom. Yeah, yeah. And, Daz you and know, Owen and team. Yeah. Great so, people. And, Such great people. Yeah. Love them. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Intercom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we love hey, guys. you. We love you. <laughs> um, so, but uh, you were talking a bit about you know, the original positioning at yeah. Intercom. And so I thought it would be fun because we're on the positioning show yeah, yeah. to talk about your work there and like what you understand about how that positioning looked at the beginning and how it evolved and why yeah, it evolved. Yeah. And like, let's hear that. Yeah. yeah. So, so I think uh, Des and Owen had done two startups prior. Yeah. And one of the things that they had realized is when they went to scale, they had a bunch of disparate databases and pieces that as they tried to scale, putting it together connecting all those dots was very complicated and hard. Yeah. And so every time, you know, you had to buy an email server, you had to buy a chat, you had to buy like all these different pieces. It was, so this is 2010 ish. Right? right. And so, and having sold their other previous startups, it was one of those things where it's like, you know, people would value if we put everything in one place, they don't need, yep. they don't need the best of everything, but they just need it all in one place. And yep. so the original positioning was, look, we, we're, we're going to give you all the tools you need to start a SaaS business. And at the same time, we're going to give you basically all the tools that you need to basically make sure it all stays in one place around the customer. And they got to, you know, year one was like three and a half million, right? Mm -hmm. Which is pretty good. Year two was, uh, or maybe it was three and then it was two. But when we got involved- Intercom with, guys are listening to this going, wrong, wrong. wrong. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> but it was in this neighborhood. By, by the time that, that, that Des and Owen reached out, because we had talked beforehand about a couple of things. And, yeah. and, they, and they basically said, hey, would you come and do some interviews? Because like, we're, we're starting to stall. We're not, the growth rate isn't where we need it to be. Like, help us understand you know, what else we can do. And so we went and we just did like 10, 12 interviews, not a bunch mm -hmm. of interviews, but we just interviewed people to say, what caused you to say, today's the day that you need intercom? Like yeah. what, what, what hole was, was dug yep. that intercom could fill. Yep. And, and we ended up coming back with four really different jobs and mm -hmm. none of them had to do with the original premise of data being all in one place. Right. And it turns out that some people hired it to basically help me acquire, people are coming to the site, but they're not converting. Help me convert. Well, it turns out that competes with HubSpot. Another one we had was, oh, you know what? We have all these requests for, 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 uh, technical requests for, for support. It's like, yeah, we're going to use intercom for that. It's like, well, why, why would you use that? Turns out that competes with Zendesk. And so yeah. instead of having 
one positioning and one product, it turns out they end up having four really different products right. that came off the same platform. Yeah. And so what's so cool about the story to me is that they, as a product person, what they did is they didn't actually build new features. The first thing they did is they just turned off features that were irrelevant to the job. Right. And so instead of trying to create four products, they literally just stripped away things to make the four products. Right. And that's how they scaled it. So interesting. And they went from basically 5 million to 75 million in 18 months, which amazing. is crazy. That's crazy. crazy. That's right? crazy. And the, the, team, the team was amazing too. So, Yeah. I mean, execution on this stuff is such a big deal. It's one thing to talk about it theoretically. And then even when you have the insight, it's, it's like your folks with the milkshakes right. to turn it into a smoothie. Like, even when you have the insight that tells you this is what's going on and this is what folks are trying to do. Being able to actually execute on that yes. is like... Well, and so this is where I... I so I do a lot of work w uh, with startups. And, and one of the things I talk about is like, if they have a vision of what they need to build, just go build it. Like the notion of trying to get them to figure out how to tweak it to fit the job is what happens. You end up having so much battle because in their mm. mind, it's their product. It's what they want to do. But once it's out of their mind and now they want traction, mm. now we can talk to customers because then they can hear. But otherwise, they're trying to convince customers about the way they want to do whatever CRM or whatever they have going on. Right. And so to me, it's, it's ultimately there's like mature uh, startup people second, third, fourth time founders, they know they have to find a struggling moment. They know they have to find basically a place where people are dissatisfied. Yep. But first time founders are typically so in love with the product that That's I almost got to tell them like, go build what you're going to build and call me back, you know, dial me back when you're ready. And, 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 and it works. And it, well, it's it, the same, it's because the same they're, not, they're really not ready to hear it. Right. They're not ready to hear it. And, and it, it's all theoretical. Like the, like the thing is like, like with positioning work, but yes, really early stage folks will come to me and say, we got to really nail the positioning before we launch. And I'm like, how on earth would we do that? <laughs> like, we just don't know right. enough about who the, who the, who the customers are actually going to compare you to, yeah. how they go through a purchase process, how they make decisions. Yeah. Like we know nothing about that. And we can interview ahead of time yes. to try and validate our positioning well, we can thesis. See the patterns of how people do it now and, right. and how do we get in their way. Right. But then, but then, but then you put the thing out there and what ends up happening is, oh, we interviewed people that looked like this, but it turns out people that look like this actually love our thing and they're yeah, doing, yeah. you know, and so we don't but, know. We got nothing to but, grab onto. But this is what, this is where... It, this is where people make the mistake. They call that a pivot. Ooh, we're oh, pivoting, my right? Gosh, and yeah. you start to realize that that the pivot really comes from from when you get to product market fit. And most people are trying to build the product and bring people to the product, as opposed to build the product and bring it to the people. Right. And the pivot comes when you start to realize, like, I want you know, ten million people. I want you know, this size companies. You know, all the all the usual stuff that you put out to target. And you start to realize, like but they're not buying it there right. or, or like th this is where I always, I have a big problem with uh, Tam total addressable market, because at some point they talk about like, well, there's 18 million small businesses in this geography that does this and this and this <laughs> that we can target. I'm like, yeah, but right. how many are struggling? If they're not struggling, yes. they can't see you. And so this is why positioning is so important because positioning takes into account, not only what your product is, but what it does for them in a very specific context. Right. And that's what that to me is the is the is somehow we got taught that we need to develop products and talk about products almost irrelevant of context and that it can solve anything and do anything in yeah. any situation or just don't talk about context. But context creates as much value as the product. This Absolutely. Is the, the, this is like I always say, do you like steak or do you like pizza? People go, huh? Right. I'm like, well, I like both. It's I like, like, yeah, both but things. let me let me talk about the last steak situation. If I would have put pizza in that, would have been pizza been good? It's like, well, no. And so you start right. to realize that that picking the right context to 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 have people pull things into their lives is equally important. And so, I think of marketing's job is to be the radar system to helping people know that they have the struggling moment and that mm. to be problem aware first and then to become mm. solution aware, as opposed to be solution aware and then educate them about the problem they might have. Right, right, right. What do you think about, you know, the marketers right now try to, it, it drives me a little bit crazy, but 
and I actually only see this in LinkedIn think pieces for some reason. Like it never comes up with an actual company outside yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, of LinkedIn. So but it's right, the ac academic realm or something. I guess. Yeah. Like there's this thing and, and people write so much about it. And they're talking about how, you know, we have people that are ready to buy. So like you say, people that are problem aware. Yeah. And then there's all these people that aren't problem aware. That's right. And so... Uh, there's there's kind of this thinking right now about we should be spending the majority of our time in marketing on this large swath of people that oh. are not problem aware to try to wake them up to the problem. Like, what do you think about no. that? I, I just I, like that's boiling the ocean to me. It's just a big waste. Feels of, like it to me so, too. So, so for me, this is one of those things. Like, so I built one of the things I did is I built houses, and what I found is that like, and I sold to basically first time home buyers. Divorced family with children and mm. downsizers. Think of your parents, right? Yeah. And one of the things I learned about your parents is that a lot of times they talk about downsizing, but they don't really know what they want to do and how they want to do it. But the thing that activates them very quickly to really think about it faster is one of two things. One of them gets sick. Yeah. Or one of their friends dies. And so you start to realize, like, how do I get in their way? So I move my advertising from the real estate section because the real estate section is when you you're openly admitting I'm looking, right? Right. I'm trying to get to the point where you're not even look. You're saying you want to look, but you're not even looking yet. I moved right. it from the from the from the real estate section to the obituaries, <laughs> and I literally said, <laughs> "Want to move? Don't know how to do this? Let us help." Because at some point, yeah. it turns out that that downsizers literally look at the obituaries every day to see which one of their friends died. So interesting. And you and and you start to realize. And to be honest, it got to the point where uh, the local newspaper, the Detroit Free Press, the the editor came and said, "Like we were one of the biggest real estate people," and they they came and said, "Like help me understand what's going on. We're 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 involved in this thing." called uh, disruption theory and you are fitting all the keys of what disruption theory is because you're literally moving to other places where most people aren't. And I'm like, and, I, and then I told like they had literally just come from clay and it was just one of those very funny things that, 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 that it closed the full circle. But this is the point is I think you need to know where, how do they actually get activated to look? The yeah. thing is, is we can say that there's apathy. We can say that they're not, not, we need to make them more aware. The reality is they're aware of 10 other things that are way more important than whatever you're talking about. Well, this, this and this is, is the thing is they're not, sorry. They're, they are problem aware. Like that's the thing. Like I think, I think like in that example, they are problem aware. They're just not actively looking. That, yeah, because the, the, but there's. And, but that, and there's a big difference between being not problem aware at all. Yeah, but there's something that causes people to go active. And I, that's I what you need to be able to do. That. And this is the difference is that I think the biggest disservice to marketing education is that they don't have enough rigor in the sciences. Yeah. I think that they have way more correlation than causation. Totally. And and at the same time, the fact is, is like at some point, if it correlates, then I can make what I can make it true. And the reality is like, no, this has to happen. And then that has to happen. If it happens in the opposite sequence, it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. And that's where people kind of miss it. And that's where I think yeah. posi positioning should be about guiding people and helping people to buy. It has nothing to do with helping exactly. us to sell. Exactly. Exactly. Right. So that's that. I mean, we, that's, just, we just pull that. Out. Hey, hey, you know, yeah. we should just pull that out. That'd be the sign. That, that'd be the, the sound bite for the episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, 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 but it really that, is about that. But that's but that, that's why I think that's how positioning goes off the rails and doesn't make the jump from marketing to sales. Like sometimes what you've got are these companies and they do great positioning in the marketing team. Yeah. So the marketing team's really nailing it. They really understand the answer to that question. Why, why buy us versus the other guys? What are you going to get from our stuff that you're not going to get from everyone else? But then the lead flips over to sales yeah, and sales goes into sales mode Yep, as opposed to how do I help you buy mode? Right. That's I'm right. really interested in this right it, now. By the way, it, it sounds very similar. It's feel like they're analogous, but when you dive deep so into that, though. they're so, so different. Like the process, the, the interesting part is I've done a lot of research in the sales process. I believe that the sales process is run by finance more than anybody else. Mm. It says it's run by sales and by marketing, but when can I give a discount? Right. Only when finance has done a bad projection. <laughs> <laughs> if you give me three more days, I close them after the quarter. That's does this no good because now I got to go talk to the bank. And you start to realize right. like, how in the world does, does finance give the right to give a discount? But yet, yet ultimately the fact is, is like, I, I'm actually devaluing the business by giving that discount right. to meet a projection that you made a mistake about. That makes no sense. That makes no sense at all. 
What do you think about, I want, I want to come back to, we were talking about pivots and things on pivots. Yeah. What do you think about the concept of product market fit? Do you think this is a useful concept? And, and I, I say this, like I'm a person that talks a lot about, I, I don't actually, I really hated it when the concept first came out. And it's not so much the concept of it, it's it's what people want to do with product market fit when they have it. So there's this idea that there's this magical moment, we we can't measure it. We don't, we don't know. It's like a gut feel. We know it when we have it. Yeah. And then when we have that, the thing we go do, we're all in agreement about what the thing it is we go do. Once we have that, the thing we go do is we smash our foot on the gas for marketing yep. and sales and go, go, go. But I was always the person in charge of smashing the foot on the gas. Yeah. And I was always like, well, do we, do we understand why we have product market fit? And like, what does yeah. it mean? Like, who is the market we actually fit with? And most of the time, there was not a clear definition of that. Therefore, I couldn't smash my foot so, on the gas. But I was curious. It just came to yeah. my mind. While I was, so what you were talking that, about that, that I think about is, is I always think about it actually opposite, which is they think about product market fit because it's like, how do I get the market to, to, to fit my product? How do I find the market? Yes. Right? Versus market product fit, which is these people who have this problem, what's the best product to help them make the progress they want to make? Yeah. So yeah. it's again, it gets back to causation. Right? Yeah. So how would you know just, if you have it in, if you think about it that way? Like, is there a way that we know we got it? Oh, so, so very early on, um, there are things. So what's so interesting is you start to ask people of like, how do you know this is working? And you can hear people go like, you know what? The, 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 they'll, they'll use really loose words like the vibe. The vibe is just different. I'm like, what does that mean? It's like, well, everybody's got a little bit more energy. Everybody wants to learn a yeah. bit more. And you start to realize like, and so what happens, there's a lot of early indicators of when you have it. But yeah. most people aren't asking about it. Right. And they're asking the wrong way because they're trying to standardize it. And so the earliest mm. signs of product market fit are very qualitative yeah. and they're very emotional. I agree with and that. And most people are trying to get very hard numbers to do. And so the other part, which I I think is a is is a problem, is that most people don't understand product market fit implies once you have it, it's always there and yeah. it's dynamic. And so I might have product market fit today and then COVID happens and then I don't have product market fit anymore. And so exactly. product market fit is a is a is 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 almost like a, a machine you have to dial all the time totally. and know how the how the the market is changing. Positioning is like that, right? Like, like people get this idea. This is part of the reason why people get stressed out when they're doing positioning. Is they have this idea we're going to carve it into the stone yeah, tablets, yeah, yeah. and it's going to be it shall never change. No, and everyone gets scale. very anxious about scale. it. And then it's like, but, but you know, our product doesn't stay the same. The market doesn't stay the same. The competitors aren't sitting around building the That's same right. thing every year. Like, and if we have to change the position, boy, the marketers can't be that good. And it's like, no, that has nothing to do with it. <laughs> right. Right. It's like, it's, it's like, like, like well, we've, we tried that positioning two years ago and it didn't work. Okay. Well, you know what? That positioning might work now because the environment changed. I don't understand. God, like, so well, we tried that. that and it won't work. You're yeah. Like, we oh, tried okay. it once and it didn't work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I get that. I get that a lot. And so I do think it helps people sort of relax about the positioning yeah. though, when they get this idea that it's this kind of dynamic thing, the same way the markets are dynamic, your competitors are dynamic, your product itself, like you're yeah. building stuff and your product two years from now is going to look different. It's going to have different capabilities and, you know, and, and, and everybody says, oh, okay, good. And then people kind of relax about it. Yeah. The other thing that I get a lot is like people will look at, and I read a lot of books that write case studies this way too. And they'll say, Salesforce, you know, their positioning looked like this. Yeah. And what they're talking about is Salesforce's positioning at 2 billion revenue, 10 billion, very wherever different, they're very at. Different. And, and they'll try to extrapolate that back and say, well, this is why they were successful in the very early days. It's like, dude, their positioning was totally different, different. That's right. That's <laughs> in right. the early days. This, this and is, so you're telling these little startups, oh, do it like this. And it's like, you would never do, do it that. like that. <laughs> they didn't do well, it like they, that. They didn't when do they were it like little. that when they were this size either. And this, <laughs> this is the thing is, is people don't understand that, that, like this is where again, I think people are, are trying to build process too, process too soon because they they, yeah. they literally are trying to scale things before they understand how they work. That's really what we're trying to do: is how do customers work? How do customers buy? Not how does my product work? Right. And 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 so part of this is to realize, like, uh, I was just talking to somebody earlier, and I said, like, you know, I have a glass. That glass, as it sits on the table, has no value. It only has value when I, as a customer, interact with it, pour something into it and drink it. It And again, it's the context of like, is the liquid more important than the glass? Well, if I don't have a place to drink, then yeah. 
Yeah. If I can drink it out of the can, then the, then the, it actually possesses less value yeah. because of the context I'm in. And so you start to realize like people I've been trying to, you know, almost like wash away context, wash away these other pieces to kind of say, here's how we're different and unique. And the reality is, is like at some point, the context is just as important to understand totally. that value. Totally. And value totally is, is ultimately, uh, you and I had talked about this is, the, I've in my mind, I have two kinds of value. There's customer value. There's demand side value, which is the money I'm willing to give you to help me make progress. Right. And then there's supply side value, which is the profit that I make from literally helping you make that progress. And so whether if I don't yeah. make any money or I make a ton of money, the reality is like I still will only make so much money from one thing. So this was awesome. Yep. Thank you so much well, thank for you. coming thank, on. And one like, thing for coming down too is uh, I need to come up, but at the same time, this was just, uh, uh, it's always good to spend time. It's good to spend time. Yeah. And thank you for like the, you know, the whole Joe Rogan experience yeah, we're having really, here. We've never done we, this well, outside we've of my office. This together so, very, very so excited. In less than an hour, we're like, okay, we're setting up With the all the equipment in the world, I might add. But <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, thanks yep, so thank much. Thank you. See ya. All right. Bye. All right. So that's it. I hope you folks enjoyed the episode. I thought it was so much fun talking to Bob about this stuff. I just wanted to come on and say thanks again for listening. I really appreciate you folks hanging out and being with me on this journey. As always, I'm going to ask you, like, please, please leave me some feedback. Uh, give me a rating. Give me a review. This podcast is new. And so all that stuff really means a lot to me. And it's important to me to understand what's working and what isn't. The other thing I was going to mention is I got a book coming out. I mentioned it a little bit, but we're getting very close to the launch of that book. So by the time this episode goes live, oh, we're going to be so close. The book is called Sales Pitch and you're going to be able to pre-order it soon or order it depending on when you're listening to this podcast. I cannot wait to get it out. I'm so excited. That's it for this week. Thanks so much. And I'll see you next week.